By way of introduction, let me uh, simply say that I'm John DeVol. I'm a, a resident here at the forest. And um, prior to coming to the forest, I was historian at Fort Bragg, working uh, on, on mainly military history uh, programs with the Army, particularly with the 82nd Airborne Division. And the book that I'm going to read from today by Rick Atkinson is part of a uh, three-volume work that Atkinson did on the history of the United States Army uh, in the Second World War. It's in marvelous history. This is the third volume, which came out uh, not too many years ago. Um, and uh, it's, it's a marvelous history. And this particular volume starts with Normandy and goes to the end of the war. Atkinson has always been interested in military history. He started his career as a New York Times reporter, and I met him in the 80s when he came to Fort Bragg and used my office to interview a battalion commander in the 82nd, a young lieutenant colonel, who later rose to be the commander of the 101st Airborne Division. And that was Atkinson's point. The name of the book, or the title of the book, was The Long Gray Line. It was about West Point and the education at West Point. And so it was fun to see that interview and then see that colonel go right straight up to two stars. Um, so this is an excellent book. Atkinson is now working on a history of the American Revolution, and his first volume is out, and I suspect it'll be another trilogy. It'll be another three-set three set book um, uh, that will deal with the American Revolution. He also wrote an excellent book on the... Um, he also wrote an excellent book on the um, Gulf War, uh, 30 years ago, uh, which which was called Crusade. So um, he's a good writer. He's, his background is as a reporter, but like many reporters, there are several reporters who've gone into reporting on military history subjects. He's the best in my book. Um, and speaking of books, I will say this about the history of the Second World War, and particularly about Normandy, which is on everybody's mind. I've been to Normandy on a number of occasions. I've taken 82nd soldiers on battlefield tours. Uh, I, could, I could walk you through the Normandy invasion uh, uh, in a couple of days and, and show you all of the key places that the battles were fought. So I have, an, I have a close relationship with that battlefield and the French people who live in Normandy who are, to this day, deeply grateful for what we did in the Second World War. There are a lot of people who say, well, the French are rude and they're difficult to deal with, and if you don't speak French, they don't like you. In Normandy, they love you if you're an American. And if you're a soldier from the 82nd Airborne Division, they'll embrace you and they won't stop. But if you had to take uh, all the books written on Normandy and the Second World War, um, uh, books like this very recent one by James Holland that came out in uh, 2019, these books would stretch from the floor to the ceiling and probably up to the roof. The bibliography on the Second War, World War continues to grow, and more recent authors have changed the way they write their history by adding more direct comments from veterans particularly, so that you get a much more personal view of the war from a soldier's point of view. So I'm going to read from Atkinson's book, and I'm going to read from the prologue. I discovered very quickly you can't read much in this setting because you think you're going to read 40 pages, you're not. You're going to be lucky to get to 15. So I'm going to read from the prologue about the coming of the Normandy invasion. And this starts in May of 1944, and um, uh, it'll give you some background on the state of England in 1944 and the state of the English people which I have to say was very, very difficult. And it's a, it's a fascinating thing to read. And then I'll bring this up to Eisenhower's farewell to the, the American paratroopers in the 101st Airborne Division as they get ready to emplane and go to France for the beginning of the invasion. So let me start. Pro
prologue from Rick Atkinson's The Guns at Last Light, The War in Western Europe, 1944 to 1945. A killing frost struck England in the middle of May 1944, stunning the plum trees and the berry crops. Stranger still was a persistent drought. Hotels posted admonitions uh, above their bathtubs. The English army crossed the desert on a pint of day. Three inches only, please. British newspapers reported that even the king kept quite clean with one bath a week in a tub filled only to a line which he had painted on it. Gale winds from the north grounded most Allied bombers flying from East Anglia and the Midlands. Although occasional fleets of flying fortresses still could be seen sweeping towards the continent, their contrails spreading like ostrich feathers. Nearly five years of war had left British cities as bedraggled, unkept, and neglected as rotten teeth, according to an American visitor, who found that the people referred to before the war as if it were a place and not a time. The country was steeped in heavy smells of old smoke and cheap coal and fatigue. Wildflowers took root in bombed out lots from Birmingham to Plymouth. Sow whistle, Oxford ragwort, and rose bay willow herb, a tall flower with purple petals that seemed partial to catastrophe. Less bucolic were the millions of rats swarming through the 3,000 miles of London sewers. Exterminators scattered 60 tons of sausage poisoned with zinc phosphate and stale bread dipped in barium carbonate. Privation lay on the land like another odor. British men could buy a new shirt every 20 months. Housewives twisted, <coughs> twisted pipe cleaners into their hair clips. Iron railings and grill work had long been scrapped for the war effort, and even cemeteries stood unfenced. Few shoppers could find a fountain pen or a wedding ring or bed sheets, vegetable peelers, shoelaces. Posters discouraged profligacy with depictions of the squander bug, a cartoon rodent with swastika pockmarks. Classified advertisements, including pleas in the Times of London for unwanted artificial teeth and cash donations to help wounded Russian war horses. An ad for the Chevu household services promised bombed upholstery and carpets cleaned. Other government placards advise food is a munition. Don't waste it. Rationing had begun in June 1940 and would not end completely until 1954. The monthly cheese allowance now stood at two ounces per citizen. Many children had never seen a lemon. Vitamin C came from the turnip from turnip water. The Ministry of Food promoted auster austerity bread with a whisper of sawdust and victory coffee brewed with acorns. Walton pie, a concoction of carrots, potatoes, onions, and flour, was said to lie like cement upon the chest. And for those with strong palates, no ration limits applied to sheep's head or to eels caught in local reservoirs or to roast cormorant a stringy substitute for chicken. More than 50,000 British civilians had died in German air raids since 1940, including many of, uh, in the resurgent baby blitz begun in January 1944 and just now petering out. Luftwaffe spotter planes illuminated clouds in a rust, into rusty light before the bombs fell. A, diary, a diarist on May the 10th noted uh, the great steady swords of searchlights probing for enemy aircraft as flak fragments spattered across the rooftops like hailstones. Even the Wind Wimbledon Tennis Club had been assaulted in a recent raid and pitted center court. Uh, a groundskeeper patched the shredded nets with string. Tens of thousands sheltered at night in the tube and the cots standing in tiers along the platforms of 79 designated stations were so fed it that the sculptor Henry Moore likened wartime life in these underground rookeries to the hold of a slave ship. 
It was said that some young children, perhaps those also unacquainted with women, had never spent a night in their own beds. Even during these short summer nights, the mandatory blackout, which in London in mid-May lasted from 10.30 p.m. to 5.22 a.m., was so intense that one writer found the city profoundly dark, like a mental condition. Darkness also cloaked an end of day's lust, fueled by some 3.5 million soldiers now crammed into a country smaller than Oregon. Hyde and Green Parks at dusk were said by a Canadian soldier to resemble a vast battlefield of sex. Proud Britain's, <coughs> Proud Britain soldiered on, a bastion of civilization even amid wars and dignities. A hurdy-gurdy outside the Cumberland Hotel played, You would not dare insult me, sir, if Jack were only here, as large crowds on Oxford Street, Oxford Street sang along with gusto. London's West End cinemas this month screened For Whom the Bell Tolls, starring Gary Cooper and Ingrid Bergman, and Destination Tokyo with Cary Grant. And theater patrons could see John Gilgood play Hamlet or Noel Coward's Blythe Spirit, now in its third year at the Duchess. At Ascot on Sunday, May 14th, thousands pedaled their bicycles to, a track, to the track to watch Kingsway, a cold of the first class, gallop past Merchant Navy and gone. Apropos of the current cold snap, the Royal Geographical Society sponsored a lecture on the formation of ice in lakes and rivers. Yet nothing brightened the drab wartime landscape more than the brilliant uniforms now seen in every pub and on every street corner. The exotic plumage of Norwegians and Indians, Belgians and, and Czechs, Yorkshiremen and Welshmen, and more Yanks than lived in all of Nebraska. One observer in London described the panoply. French sailors with their red pom-poms and striped shirts, Dutch police in black uniforms and gray silver braid, the dragoon-like mortar boards of Polish officers, the smart gray of nursing units from Canada, the red berets and sky blue trimmings of the new parachute regiments, gaily colored field caps of all the other regiments, the scarlet linings of our own nurses' cloaks, the electric blue of Dominion Air Forces, and bush hats and lime colored turbans, the prevalent Royal Air Force blue, and a few green-tinted Russian uniforms. Saddle Row tailors offered a specialist for every cardinal of bespoke uniform, from tunic to trousers, and the well-heeled officer could still buy an English military rain <coughs> raincoat at Burberry um, or a silver pocket flask at Dunhill. Even soldiers recently arrived from the Mediterranean theater added a poignant splash of color, thanks to the anti-malaria pills that turned their skin a pumpkin hue. Nowhere were the uniforms more impressive on Monday morning, May the 15th, than along Hammersmith Road in West London. Here the greatest Anglo-American military conclave of the war gathered on the war's 1,720th day to rehearse the death blow intended to destroy Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. Admirals, generals, field marshals, logisticians, and staff wizards by the score climbed from their limousines and marched into a Gothic building of red brick and terracotta, where American military policemen, known as snowdrops for their white helmets, pistol belts, and leggings and gloves, scrutinized the 146, 146 engraved invitations and security passes distributed a month earlier. Then six uniformed ushers escorted the guests, the guests, later described as big men with an air of fame about them, into the model room, a cold and crepuscular auditorium with black columns and hard, narrow benches reputedly designed to keep young schoolboys away. The students at St. Paul's School had long been evacuated to rural Berkshire. German bombs had shattered 700 windows across the school's campus, but many ghosts lingered in this tabernacle of upper-class England. Exalted old Paulines included the poet John Milton, the astronomer Edmund Haley, 
The first Duke of Marlborough, John Churchill, who supposedly learned the rudiments of military strategy from a school library book, and the diarist Samuel Pepys, who played hooky to watch the beheading of Charles I in 1649. Top secret charts and maps now line the model room. Since January, the school had served as the headquarters for the British 21st Army Group, and here the detailed planning for Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of France, had gelled. As more senior officers found their benches in rows B through J, some spread blankets across their laps or cinched their greatcoats against the chill. Row A, 14 armchairs, arranged elbow to elbow, was reserved for the highest of the mighty, and now these men began to take their seats. The Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, dressed in a black frock coat and really in his usual Havana cigar, entered with the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Neither cheers nor applause greeted them, but the assembly stood as one when King George VI strolled down the aisle to sit on Eisenhower's right. Churchill bowed to his monarch and then resumed puffing his cigar. As they waited to begin at the stroke of 10 a.m., these big men, with their air of eminence, had reason to re rejoice in the joint victories um, and to hope for greater victories still to come. Nearly all of the senior commanders had served together in the Mediterranean. They called themselves Mediterraneanites, and they shared Eisenhower's sentiment that the Mediterranean theater will always be in my blood. There they, there they had indeed been blooded, beginning with the invasion of North Africa in November 1942, when Anglo-American forces had swept aside uh, feeble Vichy French defenders, then pivoted east through the wintry Atlas Mountains into Tunisia, joined there by the British Eighth Army, which had pushed uh, all the way from Egypt after a signal victory at El Alamein, Together they battled the Germans and Italian legions for five months before a quarter million uh, Axis prisoners surrendered in May 1943. The Anglo-Americans pounced on Sicily two months later, overwinning the island in six weeks before invading the Italian mainland in early September. The fascist regime of Benito Mussolini collapsed and the new government in Rome renounced the Axis Pact of Steel to make common cause with the Allies. But a death, a death struggle at Salerno, south of Naples, foreshadowed another awful winter campaign as Allied troops struggled up the Italian boot for 200 miles in one bloody brawl after another with entrenched German troops uh, at places like San Pietro and Ortona and the Rapido River, Casino and Anzio. Led by Eisenhower, many of the Mediterraneanites had left for England in mid-campaign to begin planning overlord, and they could only hope that spring, the spring offensive, launched on May 11th and codenamed Diadem, would break the stalemate along the Gustav Line in central Italy and carry the long-suffering Allied ranks into Rome and beyond. Elsewhere in this global conflagration, Allied ascendancy in 1944 gave confidence of eventual victory, although no one doubted um, that the future battles would be even more horrific than those now finished. Command of the seas had been largely secured by Allied navies and air forces. A double American thrust across the central and southwest Pacific had steadily reversed Japanese gains with the Gilbert and Marshall Islands regrouped. Summer would bring assaults on the Marianas, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam as the American lines of advance converged on the Philippines and captured airfields provided bases for the new long-range B-29 superfortresses to bomb Japan's home islands. A successful Japanese offensive in China had been offset by a failed thrust from Burma across the Indian frontier into southern Assam. With most of the U.S. Navy committed to the Pacific, along with almost one quarter of the Army's divisions and all six Marine Corps divisions, the collapse of Tokyo's vast empire had begun. The collapse of Berlin's vast empire in Eastern Europe was well advanced. Germany had invaded the Soviet Union in 1941 with more than three million men. But by the beginning of 1944, 
German casualties exceeded 3.5 million, even as Soviet losses quadrupled that figure. The tide had turned in all senses, uh, red in all senses, um, and Soviet campaigns to recapture the Crimea, the western Ukraine, and the territory between Leningrad and Estonia chewed up German strength. The Third Reich now had 193 divisions on the Eastern Front and, it, and also in Southeastern Europe, compared to 28 in Italy, 18 in Norway and Denmark, and 59 in France and the Low Countries. Nearly two-thirds of the German combat strength remained tied up in the East, although the Wehrmacht still mustered almost 2,000 tanks and other armored vehicles in Northwestern Europe. Yet the Reich was ever more vulnerable to air assault. Allied planes flying from Britain in May 1944 would drop 70,000 tons of high explosives on Axis targets, more than four times the monthly tonnage of a year earlier. Though they paid a staggering cost in airplanes and air crews, the Royal Air Force and the U.S. Army Air Force had won mastery of the European skies. At last, after wresting air and naval supremacy from the Germans, the Allies could make a plausible case for a successful invasion of the continent by ground forces currently gathering in England. In 1941, when Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union first formed their grand alliance against the Axis, the only plan was to persevere, as Churchill put it. Perseverance had brought them to this brink, um, a chance to close with the enemy and destroy him and his European citadel four years after Germany overran France and the Low Countries. The Americans had long advocated confronting the main German army as soon as possible. A muscle-bound pugnacity decried as ironmongering by the British strategists, whose preference for reducing the enemy gradually by attacking the Axis periphery had led to 18 months of Mediterranean fighting. Now as the great hour approached, the arena would shift north and the British and Americans would monger their iron together. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. At 10 a.m. that Monday, Eisenhower rose to, to greet the 145 comrades who would lead the assault on Fortress Europe. Behind him in the cockpit of the model room lay an immense plaster relief map of, Nor of the Normandy coast where the river Seine spilled into the Atlantic, 30 feet wide, and set on the tilted platform visible from the back benches, the apparition depicted its, in bright colors and on a scale of six inches to the mile, the rivers, villages, beaches, and uplands of what would become the world's most famous battlefield. A brigadier wearing skid-proof socks and armed with a pointer stood at port arms, ready to indicate locale soon to chief household notoriety. Cherbourg, Salo, Caen, Omaha Beach. With only a hint of the, of the famous grin, Eisenhower spoke briefly, a man at peace with his soul, in the estimate of one American admiral. He, <coughs> he hailed king and comrades alike on the eve of the great battle, welcoming, 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 welcoming them to the final vetting of an invasion blueprint two years in the making. A week earlier, he had chosen June the 5th as D-Day. I consider it to be the duty of anyone who sees a flaw in this plan not to hesitate to say so. Eisenhower said, it's voice, uh, his voice booming, I have no sympathy with anyone, whatever his station, who will not speak, uh, who will not, who will not speak, and make criticisms, criticisms that are needed. We are here to get the, boss, the best possible result. The Supreme Commander would remain preoccupied for some weeks with the sea and air demands of Overlord, as well as with the sundry political distraction. So he had delegated the planning and conduct of this titanic land battle in Normandy to the soldier who would now review his battle scheme. A wiry elfin figure in immaculate battle dress and padded shoes popped to his feet, pointer in hand. 
The narrow, vulpine face was among the empire's most recognizable. A visage to be gawked at in claringes or huzzahed on the strand. But before General Law Montgomery could utter a single um, word, a sharp rap sounded. The rap grew louder. A snowdrop flung open the model room door, and in swaggered Lieutenant George S. Patton, Jr., a ruddy, truculent American Mars, newly added by, outfitted by those saddle rogue artisans in bespoke overcoat, bespoke trousers, and bespoke boots. Never reluctant to stage an entrance, Patton swept through London in a huge black Packard with his three-star insignia flapping in the breeze and sporting dual greyhound bus horns. Ignoring Montgomery's scowl, he found his bench in the second row and sat down, eager to take part in a war he condemned without conviction as goddamn son of a bitchery. It is quite pleasant to be famous, Patton had written to his wife Beatrice. Probably it's bad for the soul. With a curt swish of, a, of his poem, Montgomery stepped to the great floor map. He had just returned from a hiking and fishing holiday in the Highlands, sleeping each night in his personal train, the rapier. Uh, glancing at his notes, 20 brief items written in his tidy cursive on unlined stationery, Montgomery began in his reedy voice, each syllable as sharply creased as his trousers. There are four armies under my command, he said, two comprising the assault force into Normandy, and two more to follow in exploiting the beachhead. We must blast our way on shore and get a good lodgment before the enemy can bring sufficient reserve to turn us out. Armored columns must penetrate deep inland and quickly on D-Day. This will upset the enemy's plans and tend to hold him off while we build up our strength. We must gain space rapidly and peg out claims well inland. The Bay of the Sun, which lay within range of almost 200 fighter airfields in England, had been designated as the invasion, invasion site more than a year earlier for both its flat, sandy beaches and its proximity to Cherbourg, a critical port needed to supply the invading horde that was now going to be approaching. Secret, um, uh, upon returning from Italy five months earlier, Montgomery had widened the overlord, uh, Overlord's assault zone from 25 miles proposed in the earlier plan to 50 miles. Instead of three seaborne divisions, five would lead the assault. Two American divisions in the west, two British and one Canadian in the east, proceeded seven hours earlier by three airborne divisions to secure the beachhead flanks and help the mechanized forces thrust inland. This grander overlord required two, 230 additional support ships and landing vessels such as the big LSTs or landing ship tanks that had proved invaluable during the assaults in Sicily and at Salerno in Italy and Anzio. Assembling that larger fleet in turn meant postponing the Normandy invasion from May until early June and delaying indefinitely an invasion of southern France originally scheduled to occur at the same moment. As he unfolded his plans, Montgomery wandered across the plaster beaches with the tiny Norman villages, head bowed, eyes darting, hands clasped behind his back, except when he pinched his left cheek in a characteristic gesture of contemplation or when he stressed a particular point with a flat of his hand. Often he repeated himself for emphasis, voice rising in the second iteration. He was, one staff officer observed, essentially didactic by temperament, and, um, and he liked a captive audience. No audience had ever been more rapt. The officers perched on these unforgiving benches, huddled in their blankets and craning their necks, only Churchill interrupted with mutterings about too many vehicles in the invasion brigade at the expense of too few cutthroat foot soldiers. And was it true, he subsequently demanded, that the great force would include 2,000 clerks for record keeping? 
Montgomery pressed ahead. Hitler's so-called Atlantic War now fell under the command of an old adversary, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. German divisions in Western Europe had already doubled since October, from 37 to almost 60. One reason that Montgomery had insisted on a better and a heftier invasion force. He continued, Last February, Rommel took command from Holland to the war. It is now clear that, that his intention is to deny any penetration. Overlord is to be defeated on the beaches. Rommel is an energetic and determined commander. He has made a world of difference since he took over. He is best at the spoiling attack. His forte is disruption. He will do his level best at Dunkirk us, not to fight the armored battle on the ground of his own choosing, but to avoid it altogether by preventing our tanks landing by using his own tanks well forward. Some officers in chafe, Eisenhower's Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, believe that German resistance might collapse from internal weakness with the result that Overlord would quickly become an occupation force. Montgomery disagreed, and he ticked off the expected enemy counterpunch. Five German divisions, including the 21st Panzer Division, would oppose the invaders on D-Day. By dusk, two other Panzer Divisions would join the fight, reinforced by two more at the end of D plus one, the second day of the invasion. For a total of nine German divisions, battling eight Allied divisions ashore. After a sea voyage and a landing on a strange coast, there's always some loss of cohesion, Montgomery said, swatting away the understatement with his palm. A death struggle to amass combat power would determine the battle. Um, Overlord's plan called for Allied reinforcements to land at the rate of one and one third divisions per each day. But a bit more than a week into the fight, two dozen German divisions could well try to fling 18 Allied divisions back into the sea. Montgomery envisioned a battle beyond the beaches in which the British and Canadian Second Army on the left grappled with the main force of German defenders, while the American First Army on the right invested Cherbourg. Three weeks or so after the initial landings, Patton's Third Army, with thunder into France, swung through Brittany to capture more ports and then wheeled the river Seine around D plus 90. Three months into the operation, Paris likely would be liberated in mid-fall, giving the Allies a, a lodgment between the Seine and the, and the River Loire to stage for the fateful drive into Germany. <clears throat> Montgomery closed his, his briefing with his 20th and final point, Isaac Lint. We shall have to send the soldiers into this party seeing red, he declared. Nothing must stop them. If we send them into battle this way, then we shall succeed. The bravado reminded Churchill's chief of staff, Lieutenant General Hastings Ismay, of the eve of Agincourt, as depicted in Shakespeare's Henry V. He which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. And in that room of great generals and admirals and field marshals, no one departed. They were ready for the fight. I'm going to move forward just a bit. Um, to make my final reading. And now it is no longer Montgomery and the 15th of May, but it's the 5th of June the day that D-Day was supposed to occur, but because of weather, it had to be delayed for 24 hours. And now we're at the 5th of June. Just, just after 6 p.m., Eisenhower climbed into his Cadillac with Kay Summersby behind the wheel and the four-star bumper insignia hooded. Leading a, a three-car convoy, the Supreme Commander rolled north for 90 minutes on narrow roads clogged with military trucks. It's very hard, really, to look a soldier in the eye when you fear that you are sending him to his death, he told Summersby. At Greenham Commons Airfield in the Berkshire Downs, outside the 11th century town of Newbury, 
he bolted down to quick supper in the headquarters of the mess of the of the 101st Airborne Division, and then drove to the flight line. Hands in his pockets, he strolled amongst the C-47s, newly striped with white pen to make them stand out as Allied aircraft. Um, um, and began to talk to the soldiers who stood about with blackened faces and heads shaved or clipped mohawk, mohawk style as they wiggled into their parachute harnesses and sipped a final cup of coffee. The trick is to keep moving. If you, st if you stop, if you start thinking, you lose your focus, Eisenhower told a young soldier from Kansas. The idea, the perfect idea, is to keep moving. At aircraft number 2716, he shook hands with the division commander, Major General Maxwell D. Taylor, who was careful to conceal a bad limp from a tendon he'd injured plane squashed the previous day. Eisenhower wished him Godspeed and then returned to the headquarters manor house and climbed to the roof for a final glimpse of his men. The light of battle, he would write George Marshall, was in their eyes. To Summersby, he confessed, I hope to God I know what I'm doing. And that will con conclude. When I picked this reading, I had initially thought about reading about Omaha Beach, that terrible battle that occurred on the morning of 6th June. And it's something to behold. Um, even today, when you stand in the, the American cemetery, uh, uh, at Saint Laurent, look down on the beach, you wonder how on earth the soldiers ever got up that bluff, which is about a hundred feet in vertical height, uh, to defeat the Germans. It wasn't easy, it was awful. We've heard uh, uh, our, our neighbor uh, Jack Hughes talk about that, and Jack will again talk about that in, in his uh, interview with me, and that will be on 1390 tomorrow. So look at your activities chart. You will see when we're, we're going to do a D-Day virtual program that's pretty good, actually, um, and which my wife, Carol, helped to orchestrate. Um, and you will see something, uh, and you'll hear comments made about Omaha Beach. Tomorrow night, we're going to show um, Steven Spielberg's um, famous movie, Saving Private Ryan. The first 20 minutes of Saving Private Ryan is an exact replication of the events on D-Day in the opening minutes of the invasion, when almost every American who stepped on the beach was killed almost instantly. It was a huge tragedy. That was about 6 o'clock in the morning. But I have to tell you that by noon, the Germans were swept off the hills and the Americans were on those bluffs. And my God, it's hard to believe that it was possible to happen. But it's, as, as Eisenhower told Marshall, um, they were ready and they had victory in their mind and they weren't going to be stopped. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>